Hey everyone, it's Robert Hall, thanks for coming back. Today we're going to talk about the Sekonic L308 and I'm also going to give you some basic metering principles. Now remember guys, if you end up enjoying the video, please hit that like button before you leave, comment below with any questions, and subscribe if you wanna see more videos. So before we get into the Sekonic L308, how to use it, how it functions, if it's a great tool or not, I wanna make sure everybody's caught up on the basics of metering and just managing light in general. Just so you guys know, I am assuming here that you have an understanding of the exposure triangle. If you don't, I highly suggest that you either brush up or work on that prior to watching this video because otherwise there's a good chance that what I talk about here is going to go right over your head. So before we get into metering any light, we need to make sure that we understand how we measure light to begin with. The amount of light hitting a subject, like the light hitting my face right now, is based on two things. It is based on the intensity of the light, how high, how powerful, how bright that light can get, and it's based on the distance relative to the subject. In this case, this umbrella is right out of frame. I'm touching it right now. But if it was way further away from me, then there would be a lot less light hitting me. Easy to understand, right? So we measure that light intensity using stops. A stop of light is a relative doubling or halving of the intensity of light. And when we're talking stops, it's always relative measurement, meaning that it has to be compared to another light source in order for it to make sense. There are other figures out there that just calculate light intensity that are not relative, such as lumens or lux. But in photography, the stop slots in perfectly because it's the same increment that we use to modify our camera settings such as ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. So right here I've got an LED panel that has a percentage on the back to show you how much light it is outputting. Let's use 10% as our starting point. Now if we increase the light output to 20%, the light just increased by one stop because it doubled and went from 10% to 20%. Now if we want to increase it another stop, we have to go from 20% to 40%. Again, we're doubling it. And if we wanna go up a third stop, then we increase it to 80%. So you can see that the difference we have to increase each time gets greater and greater. Now I know what you're thinking, we typically go over flash here. So if we were talking about a speed light, a speed light stops are represented in fractions. So that's why it's really easy to get familiar with the scale of a speed light is because it's constantly going in half or doubling. It goes full, half, quarter, eighth, 16th, 32, 64th, 1 126th, 1 512th. Those are all full stops of light. Each time that it decreases one of those full stops, it is going down 50% of its previous light. It's just now occurring to me while editing that I never explained why we use the f-stop scale to measure light. So shutter speed, ISO, and aperture are all measurements of stops of light. But we don't use a shutter speed because when you measure flash output, your shutter speed isn't going to be impacted. And I'll be honest, I'm not sure how it started, but I think that we use aperture over ISO because the ISO numbers can just get astronomically high and it really wouldn't sound right. Like ISO 256,000.1 doesn't really make sense, right? Now, a lot of people get confused when you start using those f-stops that have a decimal place and then adding another decimal. For instance, f5.6.3. A lot of people don't understand what that means. f5.6 is one full stop away from f8, meaning that there are 10 tenth stop increments in between there. There's 5.6.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And at f5.6.9, you would go one more tenth stop and then you're at F8. Really the only way to keep the F-stops accurate and keep it mathematical at the same time. So now let's take that and apply it to a subject that's being hit by two lights. Turning one light on as our key light, we can meter the light hitting them. Now we have a base value to go off of. All we're gonna focus on here is aperture. And in this instance, the meter is at F4. Let's say we wanna put light on the opposite side. By matching the key light intensity all the way up to F4, we have a one-to-one -one light ratio. The light is identical on both sides. Now, let's start reducing the power of the second light. By cutting the fill light in half, we are reducing it by one stop. Since the key light is now two times as powerful as the fill light, we have a two-to-one ratio. Now, to drop the output of the fill light another stop, we have to cut the power in half again. That means it is now one-fourth the key light power, or two stops less. This is a four to one lighting ratio. Now you may have heard the term a three to one lighting ratio being so popular for portrait photography. And in a three to one ratio, that falls in between 
one stop difference and two stop difference. It's a one and a half stop difference. Knowing these ratios is a great way to get familiar with the different looks that you can accomplish using lighting. I know I really like a three to one and a four to one lighting ratio for my subjects. I just think that it presents great portrait photography, it looks really nice, it's defining without being too dramatic to the point where an entire side of their face is really dark. You may like an eight to one lighting ratio where your key light is three stops more powerful than any fill light that you have going. Now this is only part of it. You have to also understand positioning of lights to really take control of how you shape faces. But once you have an understanding of both positioning of lights and lighting ratios, you'll be able to create any look that you want. Now this principle of comparing two light sources does not only apply to two artificial lights or two studio lights. It also applies to the balance between any ambient light and any light that you add. So you can apply the same science outdoors. Let's say you're doing one flash outdoors if you make that one flash outdoors a stop brighter than your background, that's going to create emphasis on your subject. And if you make your flash two stops brighter than your background, then you're really shutting it down. You're really drawing attention to your subject and you're ignoring everything that's going on in the background. Or maybe your flash just adds this tiny bit of light maybe a third stop more than your background, than the ambient that's already existing, then your flash is pretty much going to be undetectable and a lot of people might think that the light is completely natural. So learning the ratios that you prefer both on a subject or with your subject in comparison to the natural light that exists, if you can dial those in as repeatable results, it really helps you define your style. Now you may be thinking, my camera already has a light meter built into it. Why would I need a light meter outside of that? Well, there's two primary reasons. The first is that your camera is a reflective light meter. It can only tell you the amount of light that is reflecting off of a subject. The problem is it's always trying to expose for a mid-tone gray. If your subject or whatever is reflecting light is either darker or brighter, then your meter in the camera is gonna give you an inaccurate reading. But a light meter can measure both the reflected light as well as the incident light, the true amount of light hitting a subject. And by doing so, you can use the figures that the meter gives you to accurately represent your subject regardless of what tone they are reflecting of light. And the second reason is that your camera has no capabilities to meter flash and a light meter does. Okay, so now that we covered that, let's talk about the Sekonic L308. So inside the box, you're gonna get the meter, a leather pouch to hold it in, a lanyard, and typical paperwork. There are six buttons on the L308. Power, mode, ISO, the measurement button, and an up and down button. Holding the ISO button and using the up and down arrows, you can change the ISO. Tapping the measurement button will initiate the measurement regardless of what setting you're in. The mode button switches you through the five modes, shutter priority, aperture priority, EV, cordless flash, and corded flash. Also sliding the light dome at the top allows you to switch between reflective metering in which you would point the meter from the same orientation as your camera towards your subject the same way that your camera meter works. However, if you want to measure incident light, then you keep the light sphere on and you put it in front of your subject facing whatever light source you are metering for. Let's talk about the different modes. The first three modes measure ambient lighting. The first mode is shutter priority. This allows you to set your ISO and your shutter speed. Once you've done that, you click the measure button and it will give you the required aperture that you need to shoot at for a balanced scene. Next is the aperture priority mode. This allows you to do a measurement based on your aperture and will give you the equivalent shutter speed you need for a balanced scene. In either of these modes, after your measurement, you can use the up and down switch to change either your shutter speed or your aperture if you'd like to know a different equivalent. And in both of these modes, you can also change your ISO by holding the ISO button down and using the up and down arrows. You will not lose your measurement setting until you hit the measure button again. Now, if you have settings dialed in, you can also hold down that measurement button and move it and you'll get a live reading of the light value that's hitting the meter. This lets you determine if the light is changing across a certain area of space. And of course, there's two flash modes on this meter as well. The first mode is cordless. When you click the measurement button, it's going to start blinking and essentially it's waiting until it sees a flash. Once it detects a flash, it will give you a reading. This is good to use if you've got a wireless trigger, you can sit there and hit test and change the power until you've got the desired output that you want on your meter. There is also a corded mode and this would be great if you're using it with older lights or another type of trigger, you can actually connect the PC sync directly to the light or directly to another trigger. And when you hit the test button, 
it's going to send a fire signal and try to measure it at the same time. 